Okay, we are live now. Uh, so, uh, a very good afternoon from the eastern coast of United States. Uh, I'm Venkat Maturi, the moderator of this discussion on uh, the evolutions of the new U.S. economy. And with me, I have fellow panelists Hugo Rappel and uh, Gary Whitehill. Uh, Gary, which location are you joining in from? Uh, right now, I'm up way at the top of Vermont, right near Canada. How about you? I'm in Michigan. So maybe we might uh, be sharing a similar weather. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I'm in Love Switzerland. <laughs> you are in and Switzerland. I'm in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I mean, if you permit me, I, I was I was hoping that this is how we could potentially engage over the next 45 minutes. One, of course, is I would be very eager for uh, both of you to introduce yourself. And I'm hoping for Shalab, the third panelist, also to join in, in which case we'll probably have Shalab introduce himself and then... Uh, once we have gone, it would be great when, when you introduce yourself, also give a bit of an insight into the industries and the geographies that you have exposed, exposures to, and that will probably um, give a better context to our listeners. That's one. And uh, subsequent to your introduction, it would be great if you, before we delve into this whole topic of um, how the world seems to be shaping and specifically from a supply chain side, uh, it would be great for each of you to share, how do you see the context right now, specific to the supply chains, and how do you read the situation emerging? And just as we were going through a pandemic, and we are talking about a pre-pandemic world and a post-pandemic world, it seems like now we need to see a pre-Ukraine world and a post-Ukraine world. And therefore, it would be it would be absolutely helpful to take three or four minutes after your introduction to share how you see this world. And after that, we could launch into that that discussion, take that discussion into the supply chain perspective and uh, get an assessment of, uh, from your perspective, what's happening in the supply chain, maybe in, in terms of capacities or capabilities or competencies, and then uh, move forward from there to see how do we see a way forward, assuming there are issues. And I'm sure all of us understand there are big issues coming up and there are big issues already there. And how do we take it forward from there? And hoping that we, we probably have about maybe five or 10 minutes, uh, if not more, for the questions if there are. Will that make, mm -hmm. uh, will that resonate with both of you? That's okay. great. So uh, let me start with you, Hugo. Maybe if you could introduce yourself for a couple of minutes and then walk about the context the way you see it. Okay, I uh, I'm running today GLG Logistics Systems uh, after 40 years being an executive uh, owner of uh, various companies in logistics all over the world. I was in the States for quite some time, and uh, today uh, we advise uh, shippers, consigners uh, for their supply chain execution strategies. Mm -hmm. And you want to hear my view, actually? I'll or let Gary let first? Gary, yeah, let Gary introduce himself and then... Okay. Well, it's going to be an interesting discussion with you, Hugo. That, that's, that's for sure. If that's your particular expertise, mine's a little bit more macro than that. So uh, I'm the chairman of a company called Geostrategic Holdings. Uh, so what we do is talk about trends in, in paradigm shifts that lead to systemic transformation on the future's edge. So we work a lot with Intel defense and, and security uh, agencies, sometimes high net worth families, um, but usually administration level of countries talking about, uh, you know, the intersection of kind of agriculture, finance, energy and uh, government policy at an institutional resilience level. So um, before that was doing entrepreneurship and innovation capacity building in, across four continents. So um, I've lived in Ghana, Nigeria, Serbia, Slovenia, uh, and as, as you were asking also, what other countries? So I've, I've spent time in about 120 so first, second, third world, um, and even war zone as well, Afghanistan, for instance. So the, the, the context I bring to this is both starting as an entrepreneur and building companies and then getting into the intel defense and security world by accident. Because when, when you spend enough time building entrepreneurship capacity, particularly in third world and war zone countries, you realize that economics is usually not the, the, the centrality. It's not the core of the, of the plan. 
um, whether that's a, a, a forward plan or, or, or a defensive plan, you know, usually the organizing principle is uh, military, right? The military doctrine. But as I tell folks, just as a, as a simple um, framework, you know, humans want to be happy, healthy, and take care of their family. It doesn't matter what first, second, or third world country or war zone you're in. That's it. Those are the three things people care about. And if they don't have them, they rape, enslave, and kill people. That's it. It's a three by three matrix. That's how the world works. And at the core of it is economics. And so when you have an economic strategy at the center of everything you're doing socially, politically, economically, militarily, civically, uh, you have a better opportunity to uh, be safer, more secure and stable. And I think we're seeing that with Russia, right? Instead of directly engaging in war, what we're using is the weapon of economics. And it's the same thing the other way, which is if you want to spur growth and you want safety, stability, and security, it's economics as well. Thank you, Gary. And uh, before before I turn in the discussion to Hugo again, a quick introduction about me. Uh, I have been a management consultant for two and a half decades, and uh, one of my strengths has been on the supply chain side and, uh, and of course, uh, operations efficiencies and so on and so forth. And I, of course, spent a bulk of my time in Asia, but I did move into um, you know, work took me into Australia and uh, you know, Japan and uh, Europe and even North America. And I had the benefit of uh, witnessing businesses and institutions from close quarters across these four continents. And of course, over the last 25 years, so so they, there is probably a progression of maturity of concerns as well as solutions and resolutions. But that being said, I think it's uh, it's fantastic to have individuals from uh, who have uh, first-hand experience across different geographies. Uh, Hugo, we're back to you, wish to understand uh, as we want to delve deeper into supply chains and the state of supply chains and how the future, how the emerging future and circumstances may impact supply chain, uh, help our audience understand what from a business perspective and maybe from a trade perspective, what are the big levers and concerns that are right now build, are the relevant context of supply chain today? I mean, we have to, uh, as a, in preparation of the meeting, we have to know why we are in this situation. Yes. Uh, with this uh, supply chain disruption. Besides, uh, uh, general statements already made between us that uh, the cheapest wins always and uh, <laughs> uh, purchase. Uh, we are in a purchase driven economy. Uh, this is correct. Um, this all uh, this led to the boom uh, of the various trade lanes. However, uh, we have to see that I mean the majority of our trade is exchanged by road and sea, whereas air has a little capacity in the overall exchange of uh, the supply chains. Uh, in majority of uh, products, of course, not uh, in uh, chips and high level uh, products. This can, live, of course, be shipped by airplane, but the majority is shipped and exchanged by ocean and uh, and truck freight, of course, locally. So uh, we had heavy subsidizing. Uh, 70s, 80s uh, of this trade, slowly in the 80s, uh, countries failing out, uh, getting out of uh, subsidies, uh, which uh, cleaned up, if you like, the uh, shipping market to reduce the amount of players, although in increasing ships. In 2008, uh, we had the ship ponds falling out, the germs ship bonds, which have been essential in the investments, also in the industry, due to the fact it was tax deductible in Germany and mostly wealthy people invested into it due to the tax write-off uh, uh, this had to make. Uh, further, we had a concentration of these companies. Finally, uh, we have three groups. Uh, worldwide, where the various shipping lines are connected to, and the three groups is more or less a cartel, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, dictating the price. 
So with the situation in the market that we do not have an overproduction anymore, there is a cartel in it, COVID and everything what uh, came behind, uh, we went into a situation where uh, disruptions on one side cause disruption on the other side. Meaning, if you have a problem in Asia with a turn around the world situation of all these ships, uh, you feel it in America, you feel it in Europe, then you, we had this uh, air given stuck in the Suez Channel. Um, okay, it's 10, 12 days, but within 10, 12 days, uh, uh, it's about a million uh, containers empty missing in Europe. And then, and so we go on. In America, you had the situation that the truckers uh, were obliged to uh, adhere to your loss with the driving hours, etc., which dropped again about 20% of the offer in the market. Uh, and, and, and so this whole uh, situation got us today that we have uh, full ships. The ships are in slow streaming, uh, steaming, sorry, not streaming. Uh, we are doing streaming. <laughs> slow <laughs> steaming, <laughs> slow steaming, which is uh, very uh, fuel efficient. And uh, uh, and saves money. To give you an idea, a container from Shanghai to Europe cost us before about two and a half thousand dollars. Today we are on around about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars. Container from Europe to the States was in the neighborhood of eighteen hundred bucks. Today we pay eleven, twelve hundred bucks, uh, eleven, twelve thousand bucks a container. And uh, it's not really only the price, uh, you need to be connected so you're on board, etc. Mm -hmm. And all this uh, gives a, a full chain. We have another investment of about 15% in empty containers. Largest container supplier is Asia, uh, China. And in the past, uh, with a steady increase of Chinese exports uh, into the main markets, we had uh, new containers coming into the trade with the overflow of Chinese uh, trade. Uh, COVID and also American politics in, uh, in the previous uh, administration changed, had quite an impact in all of this. So, you know, uh, you can look at terminals, you can look at containers uh, into the shipping line business. Uh, we have to catch up with the situation. And I guess the actual uh, war situation will not help. Uh, I guess we will have to consider in the next couple of months how this is going further. Basically, there are a lot of ships in building, new ships also with more efficient engines. They are not all green, but they are efficient. And, uh, the IMO, that's the International Maritime Organization, made now an agreement uh, as far as CO2 reduction is concerned. And I understand from the shipping line industry to two largest existing, which I have very close contacts, that this will uh, eat up uh, if you like, the, the, the only way to achieve at the moment with what we have on hand, uh, the CO2 reductions or greenhouse uh, gas reductions, uh, it's only with slow steaming again. So the mm -hmm. additional volume which will come in will uh, be eaten up by additional transit time the ships will need in the future if we keep these uh, uh, targets in place. So uh, unfortunately, there is not a fast solution as far from a shipping uh, perspective uh, to this situation. Thank you. And Hugo, you just uh, you just touched on shipping right now. And well, supply chain itself would be so much more complicated. But Gary, as they say that uh, the world was operating in a particular way, uh, there there was goods which were moving around the world in a particular way. Uh, that particular way assumed uh, a, a network of distribution and 
you know, maybe transportation and consumption, which were not necessarily geographically co-located. And that also assumed certain political structures and power structures and uh, certain minimum degree of peace across certain regions. And then uh, assuming even if that were to be the business as usual, then we had this pressure of sustainability, so on and so forth. And then suddenly we see uh, a pandemic kind of a disruption, and then we see a warlike disruption. And of course, these disruptions can have a differential impact you know, on shipping versus, let's say, if I have a rail network between two adjacent countries, a war in another continent may or may not have any impact, but we will not know. It might have an impact on crude energy prices and you never know how things can be. But that being said, I would still like you to help the audience understand the complexity of the context we live in. Uh, you live, you live, you were in a war zone as well. You have been exposed to 120 countries. Help us understand a couple of things. When you move across these 120 countries, do you, first of all, do you even see similar appreciation of the levers of change, number one? And number two, uh, how do you see the system being more volatile from a geopolitical perspective? It's a great question. And, and I think Hugo, you know, what he had to say, put it in good context, right? Essentially, what we are in is an accordion right now. It's just fluctuating. And, and to answer your question directly, uh, the, the challenge that, that we've had with companies that are so finance driven instead of innovation driven is uh, it's basically like linear stability, right? You're looking at certain numbers such as profit margin or load capacity, and you're just extending it outward in a simple fu formula, right? And the mm -hmm. downside of linear stability uh, and it's certainly not dynamic resilience. The downside of linear stability is fragility. And that's the underside, the underbelly, the dark side, that when you're from a first world country or a first world economy, you just take the numbers in a spreadsheet for granted or the numbers that are in a 10K for granted, or if you're on a board of directors of a company for granted. Once you start to get into second world, third world, and of course, war zones, not only is it fragile, but it's increasingly dynamic, increasingly complex, and increasingly chaotic. And the, the interesting part of this accordion nature of what Hugo is describing is a lot of the third world and war zone context and variables that before were just hidden, right? They were hidden somewhere in the Middle East, or they were hidden somewhere in the, the Sahel, or they were hidden somewhere you know, in Venezuela, for instance, right? If we're looking at South America, all of a sudden a big blanket came down called COVID and went plop. And, you know, to be honest with you, if you want to take it up 100,000 feet, the core of the problem, um, it's not just at the operational level, this accordion that we're talking about, it starts way, way, way up, up back at the incentive structure that policymakers have built. Uh, in, in certain countries, right? Because these are transnational shipping, transnational supply chains, just like we have transnational criminal networks, right? Mm -hmm. So transnational criminal networks are fluid, dynamic, uh, on demand, right? They can scale up, scale down. Where on the other hand, what you have here is corporations and boards of directors that weren't future ready. They didn't understand resilience. They didn't have digitization at the core. And they didn't have any risk modeling besides your typical risk matrix. Once again, that takes profit margin versus load capacity and puts it on, you know, basically just a, a bell curve. Well, there's a very big difference between traditional risk and risk management and the way in which you ensure a supply chain, which is a quantitative way that actuaries look at risk and volatility. And mm -hmm. what Hugo's describing and what I'm calling the accordion is rapid, rampant, and frankly, ridiculous volatility. The systems, institutions, structures, and corporations that we have in the 21st century are not ready for volatile, uh, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous circumstances. And increasingly, these are the conditions we've inherited because the world is so technologically interwoven, culturally divergent in many ways, uh, but at the same time, civically and institutionally interwoven. So that's the ironic part when you then take it out and look at why have we had populism really start to grow and expand? Why are we starting to see 
fissures in social fabric in places like America, for instance, because you have this dynamic melting pot of different forces that are pushing and pulling within an accordion that's also expanding and contracting at the same time. And those different layers of volatility are not being strategically understood and addressed at the highest levels for policy and boards of directors um, at the level that we need at this point. I appreciate that uh, insight, Gary. You know, uh, generally speaking, any system can be looked at for two reasons. It's a capacity and the capability, right? And, uh, you know, and if you're trying to look forward as to how you need to evolve or mature the capacity or the capabilities, you also need to understand what are you trying to look at. But then, uh, Hugo, coming back to you, when you talked about shipping, uh, the financial motivations, uh, the, the, the partnerships or, or the consolidations or whatever that might be, uh, at least for shipping, you said that it's now getting concentrated in just a few hands, maybe two or three hands. Now, uh, maybe from a capacity perspective or, or from a cost of deployment perspective, maybe consolidation gives better scale, but then it also limits the ability to respond. And of course, uh, there can be this big cartel effect that can happen. But that being said, uh, if if things, uh, if one way not to be able to make a significant change in the ownership of shipping structures, and I'm right now asking you to consider one variable to be fixed. In that context, uh, we even as we are trying to figure out what is the impact of pandemic now and how the post-pandemic world may look like, now we have a war. And we have a Ukraine, a post-Ukraine situation. And we see now new alignments. And these alignments, which may be political, can also now have economic implications. Help us understand two things. Uh, right now, we are guessing as to what may be the eventual economic uh, geopolitical uh, alignments and what might be those economic implications of these alignments. But that being said, two questions I have for you is, where do you see shipping itself as a component of overall supply chain uh, moving? Number one. And second is, uh, should these new alignments take shape and the shipping is being consolidated in two or three players, uh, does that make the world more precarious when it comes to logistics or does it solve or maybe complicate the problem? I mean, we have to see that uh, today, uh, in order to move cargo, you talk of 25,000 uh, TUs on the ship. and. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a huge investment. It's an enormous investment, and not uh, everybody can play in this market. I guess the regulatory body has to look into it. Uh, as we buy rice, as we uh, buy corn, and have uh, legal depots everywhere, we also should consider, probably in the future, to have uh, uh, a safety measure also in the capacity, etc to do this however uh, i mean look it's long-term investments uh, there are actually from one big carrier he has 64 ships in production uh, over the next uh, four years they will be delivered uh, we may keep some old ships afterwards in it although they do not comply then anymore with the uh, greenhouse uh, situation so i guess uh, the regulatory body has to look into it uh, i presume that the actual war will interfere with these various uh, CO2 rules and uh, efforts we are doing. I presume it has a big impact uh, on this. Uh, we consult actually <clears throat> and seeing in the past, you know, the shipping lines have been also taking a lot of losses in many years. And, mm -hmm. uh, it was quite easy to ship and you played one against the other, etc., etc. And the cheapest uh, got the bid. Uh, I do not think that the shipping line industry wants to get back into this situation. So they will be very, very cautious about this. On the other hand, what can have uh, post situation in this post situation? We consult actually shippers uh, to combine their volumes together in order to be more important uh, in order to contract directly 
with carriers and not over freight forwarders and immediates because you have to see first of all uh, this freight business uh, has not really catched up with the digitalization uh, compared to the financial industries and other industries uh, shipping industry is far behind and this has to do that uh, it's a very very segmented market and everybody looks for his interest and the intermediates like the large freight forwarders etc have not brought any uh, universal solution in the digitalization of this but this is on the way and uh, digital companies are coming into this trade providing uh, uh, uh communication uh, possibilities for the futures uh, i don't want to go too much into the details but uh, there is no doubt that the shippers do have to give a bigger concern to the supply chain execution this was always low level uh, company has more spending in research and marketing etc etc and the supply chain execution this is depending the product maybe one or three percent of your overall costs so it's negligible etc okay it changed over the last couple of uh, months or year and uh, more consideration is given i have a good example uh of of managing this better just for example volkswagen logistics who mm -hmm. uh, this is spending in the area of about 1.2 billion uh, a year they contract directly with the carriers they save uh, their spaces uh, on various uh, shipping lines airlines and have then intermediates eventually uh, executing this and we believe that in the future uh, this contracting for the carrier that they may have more contracts and uh, long-term contracting so we can assure the supply chain execution over a year two years and three years for example, the highest contract rating for the time being has Costco, that's a Chinese company, they have 48% of their shipping under contract. Whereas in the two other European uh, large ones uh, are far away of such a high uh, committed uh, percentage. So on one hand, digitalization, uh, the uh, use of artificial intelligence, which uh, will help to uh, cut down on intermediates. And uh, on the other hand, we have to uh, put consigners and groups together. They will have to find out really and to know their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, they need similar data models so it can work together. And in the long term, we can then contract in a longer term basis and try to make a win-win between carriers and the loading industry there's one example actually running which is home depot who mm -hmm. chartered their own ships uh, they know their ecosystem um, they know their volumes they know how much they sell and uh, they could pretty much react is this is an exception uh mostly uh shippers uh turn over their volume to intermediates freight forwarders etc who then uh, had long term uh, short term agreements with carriers etc and this brings of course a much higher volatility uh into this so i presume in the long term uh with digitalization and combining of uh, the volume of various shippers, uh, we can uh, probably make a more resilient system, uh, knowing that um, <clears throat> uh, in the future, the carriers have all interest uh, to have long-term fully ships. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Hugh. And Gary, there is a Volvo, Hugo gave an example, then there is uh, Home Depot. 
uh, on on the consumer side of shipping capacity or supply chain capacities. And then there are shipping lines like Costco, which have 48% of their capacities contracted. Yeah. Now that's perhaps in the, in the case of large organizations who can run the risk of that capacity even going waste because we also now see air being transported back. It, technically, you have you have booked that capacity. You do not want to lose that capacity for sake of predictability, and they, yet you are therefore allowing empty containers and empty empty lines to go back. Well, that's fine. We would not know what percentage of the global trade would be managed by such large entities, but we definitely know more than substantial amount of global trade is also done by entities who may not have that kind of a wherewithal. Now, there can be two responses to it. Is yes, we could make the supply chain capacities predictable. Maybe for in making them predictable, we bring in better systems, better visibility, better forecasting, better technologies, or better contracting mechanisms, or maybe even consolidation, or maybe some intermediaries. Uh, that's perhaps one part. But there could also be a situation accentuated by the geopolitical developments and realignments that maybe they say, you know what? I mean, I understand that we can make shipping or transportation or logistics, internal, external, global, more predictable. But you know what? Maybe I should get away from this. No more should I outsource my manufacturing to a different tax regime or a different shore. Can I bring it closer home? And therefore, it's easier to move some things from Mexico to U.S. over road and then get rid of shipping altogether. So uh, there's one thing about solving the supply chain problem versus getting out of this whole problem and you know, going back to the drawing board. How would you respond to this choice? Well, it's a great question again. And, and uh, my response would be, it depends what your strategic framing and, and perspective and understanding and preparation are. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, these 2020s, you know, the 2020s are the 21st century version of the 1930s. So the 1930s, if you look back, because the world has uh, cycles, right? And they usually predictably repeat themselves every 80 to 100 years. And, you know, economically in the 1930s, we were coming out of the shadow of a financial crisis. There was slow and disappointing economic growth. There were surprising uh, levels of deflation, which I think we're going to see after this inflation. I believe it's going to go way up. Then we down. We have new, uh, new, new types of threats. I think Ukraine is a perfect example of that, particularly the, the nuclear part of that. Getting into some of the geopolitical stuff in the 1930s that are similar to what we're seeing now, you're seeing global nationalism, global populism, uh, popular appeal of authoritarian regimes. I mean, up until the Ukraine crisis, there were people actively wearing uh, Putin T-shirts all over Europe in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Um, you know, Trump was very good at talking about an every nation for itself world, whether you love him or you hate him. That's a perfect mm -hmm. example of that isolationist idea. Poland's doing some of that, although they're a little bit different because they've always just been in the breadbasket of war. So they have a different reason for it. But socially, I, I think is the most important part. Once again, going back to what I was saying before about this accordion, where we, we spend so much time talking about the operational level, we spend very little time talking about the broader geoeconomic level. I would propose yeah. that the social level is the most important, where we're seeing a rise in multi-generational family living, right? So there you're talking about in-demand, on-store um, builds of consumer products and goods, possibly, that has variable pricing strategies, right? Right now, technologically, we don't do a lot of those things, but it could be done in Walmarts in the small square footage, for instance. You're seeing a decline in, a decline in home ownership, right? because of that multi-generational. So what does that mean for UPS, FedEx, and that last mile directive, right? We have last mile problems when it comes to poor countries and folks who don't necessarily have the economic viability, but what do you do when, you know, all, roughly 20 years from now, the, house, the houses are gonna be going to half as many people, right? What, what does that mean? Fourth, global fertility is, <laughs> it is plummeting, no matter where you're looking. So when you're talking about supply chain, this idea of predictability drives me nuts because there is no predictability. The, the, it is volatility, period. Everything I just listed, the 15 things I just listed show large macro trends. I haven't even talked about climate change. Hugo, I'm surprised because I thought you would hit on that. When we're talking about these big liners and the insurance policies and how much these ships cost and the products you're putting in it, 
not to mention what's going on with climate change, not to mention what that's going to do to port infrastructure, not mentioning what that means with regard to China owning as many ports as they own around the world and what their Belt and Road Initiative will continue to build as ports and deep water ports in particular in many countries, especially in emerging nations. And so when you, you know, when you take all that and you even go the layer above that, which is the UN Security Council and, and, and NATO and a bunch of these larger macro level structures where China is starting to twist and contort the rules and regulations, right? I mean, they're on the human rights uh, uh, committee right now, for instance, right? So you're starting to see the twist and contortion of the social side of both demographically and population wise and the client, and all these things with people, then you're starting to see institutional dilution and degradation and frankly rot that's twisting and contorting these institutions that are supposed to be dem democratic. And it's a waterfall effect. It all falls downhill. So if poo falls downhill, what does that then mean strategically for companies? What does that mean operationally? And the, the challenge with companies, once again, at the leadership level, the C-suite and the board of directors is they're not talking about anything that I just talked about for the past five minutes. They're not. They're still talking about balance sheets. They're still talking about product availability. They're still talking about margins based on commodities and, and these types of things. And the variability, and I think Hugo would know better than me, but the variability between ships that are carrying consumer goods versus uh, uh, commodities versus uh, other items, there's going to be large gyrations between different buckets as well within the supply chain. And the technology, you know, the 6G that we need to do this on-demand, localized, on-site variable pricing for a lot of consumer goods, the technology is just not there yet. We're probably five, seven years away from that. And I think we need to get more towards, you know, um, some of the general intelligence things that we talk about with um, artificial learning and machine intelligence. But I'll leave that to Hugo to talk about. Gary, in fact, we're just getting the last six or seven minutes. And I really want to kind of push this discussion on this very different tangent. Now, January 2020, if we were to say that, no, for the next two years, we're going to not go to offices, people might think that you are probably uh, out of touch of reality. And two years later, we know that has happened, right? Now, whether it's going to happen or not, when China and Russia uh, signed the No Limits Agreement, and there was one line of, the, the, of course, uh, those kind of partnerships lend to very fertile imagination. For example, one imagination was... Uh, just in case, you know, the the situation gets even more difficult, uh, you know, China can stop buying German cars just to put a bit of a pressure on Germany. And let's say maybe China can uh, decide to cut off a couple of supplies to the United States. I mean, just these are, you do not have to send missiles anymore. And these could potentially create fantastic amount of pressures and tectonics in the system around the world. But of course, I would also believe a lot of it could be in the realm of imagination. But then in January 2020 and uh, you know, two years later, uh, no COVID and after COVID, we need to be sure uh, how much of it we can quickly you know, dismiss as imagination. Uh, so thinking discontinuously uh, from a supply chain perspective, from a distribution perspective, uh, it's a pretty complex and very wide ranging question. But I have this question to both of you, Gary first and uh, Hugo next is, how do you, what do you see the supply chain animal to look like in 2032? You want an honest answer? Yes. I don't think we'll have one. And would you be able to share the top two reasons why you feel you may not even have one? Well, when we have, a, and if we're talking about America-centric, right, Hugo might have a, a, a different look based on where he is, but we have an American government that's militarily unready, technologically unfit, and institutionally blind to the threats of the 21st century. So as things get increasingly volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous, and as people continue to not trust our institutions, you know, America is a backsliding democracy. And so if we're looking for a supply chain stability in the middle of a world that's VUCA, volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous, we need mm -hmm. institutions that can weather that storm that are resilient first and foremost. Uh, in, in based on what we see in Washington, D.C., in, in terms of infighting and, and what we see in terms of gridlock, and ultimately what we just see with the social fabric in the United States of America, I think it's going to get much gloomier before it gets better. Uh, mm -hmm. I think by 2035, 2040, we'll be in a different world by then. I think we will stop 
Uh, I think democracies around the world will stop taking what we have for granted. I think right now we're, a, frankly, a bunch of spoiled uh, brats who don't realize what the real world is like. And I can promise you that Americans don't. And most first world countries don't. And as they say, right, there's a common, the common thing that the hard work breeds the lazy and then the lazy destroys the hard work. And that's kind of ultimately, uh, from my humble perspective, where we are in that larger macro cycle of we have a lot of lazy entitled people who take the rights and civilities of first world nations for granted instead of understanding it's something that we have to prepare for with the larger dynamics that are volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous, and we're not doing it. So I don't Thank see you, how Gary. we get out of it. I, I, I think it's going to implode, and we need mm -hmm. to look at the mirror. And then from there, we had an accelerated trajectory towards something much more resilient, better, brighter, healthier, and um, more humane. Thank you, Gary. Hugo, how do you see, how would you respond to how the future is going to play 10 years down the line, specific to uh, this essential need of transporting stuff around the world? I mean, okay, we have equipment, it's uh, an investment uh, business, etc. But I underline absolutely what Gary says. Uh, we are uh, imploding, uh, you know, okay, uh, we follow American politics, European politics is not better. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, people at positions which are incompetent. And, uh, as Gary said, everybody thinks uh, uh, we have a right of whatever we have and uh, we forget completely the needs around us, which is partially also the situation we are in today with Ukraine and Iran. Uh, I'm not very popular with this view. I get hit left and right if you say, oh, it's a shame on us. But, uh, okay, as Gary said, uh, we have to live with it. It's the supply chain, not the technical part of the supply chain, especially supply chain execution. We follow the demand, uh, try to do that. Uh, there are definitely advantages in digitalization because that's the same problem. Uh, personal knowledge, which was here 10, 20, 30 years ago, is not there anymore. So we depend on digital uh, support to, to treat that, the, the complexity of it. So the supply chain will definitely, supply chain execution will definitely catch up in the next years. But we are part of uh, the uh, overall politics and development, which I share, carries you. So thank you so much, Hugo. And uh, I, we, must, we just just about lost Gary, but I'm sure he'll go and join in. But I do want to kind of uh, kind of summarize by saying that uh, this is a massive, massive uh, space, and it's going through upheavals. And upheavals, the nature of these upheavals, unheard of in the last ten or twenty years. And uh, the best that we can do is to bring attention to what could be those biggest areas of concern, and honestly, so. And uh, you know, they would be uh, we would be doing a great disservice by trying to be nice about things which we only know can can get even more difficult. So, by that account, I absolutely appreciate the fact that uh, you were able to bring in these perspectives. Uh, in a very large space, but difficult to cover a huge ground, but you were able to bring that perspective. And more important, I appreciate the fact that you're able to bring a certain tonality to this conversation. I think there's, there, I think that would be something which would be a big takeaway, uh, that, that there needs to be a certain degree of seriousness, and that seriousness needs to be taken to a fair degree of depth if you really want to uh, make sure the future is at least uh, better than what the circumstances might lead it to. On that count, I really want to thank both of you and uh, hope to continue these conversations on a different uh, platform someday. Thank you so much. Hope so too. All thank the best. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you both. <laughs>